this morning. So, we were talking about sleep. Why do we need to sleep? <laughs> well, we download. What else? Repair. We do road work during sleep. So sleep is important um, for repair. Oh, what did it say? Oh, yeah, that's, that's an update I can't do because they don't allow me to. <laughs> it's a, um, oh, what is it? I think it's a Java something or other. It better not. Boy, I'll be mad. Okay, sleep. So we were talking about the fact that that would make an awesome essay question. Did you have to understand the brain waves that we were able to measure? And the brain waves are what? Alpha, beta, theta, and delta. And what are they? Electrical impulse. Electrical impulse. You know, if you're going to talk in class, you should probably whisper. Yeah. Just, just a hint. <laughs> So these brain waves are electrical events. They are neurons firing off. Yes? And we can measure them on what's this what's this test? What's this instrument called? EEG, electro encephalogram or encephalography. Yes? EEG. So we can tell um, electrically just like when we talk about the cardiovascular system next semester, we can tell electrically what's going on with the heart. We do another test very similar to this on the heart called an EKG or ECG, electrocardiogram. So we can tell electrically what's going on. Um, if there's blocks in different electrical signals, if there's delays, if there's too many of certain waves that we shouldn't see, under normal circumstances, we can tell that something's going on with the brain. So that's what this test tells us. Um, so different patterns of electrical activity. Again, if something takes too long or something happens too fast, we can see that those problems exist. There's four different ones. We should know the four different ones. And again, from your outline, I want a basic understanding of what each of them are. So, brains in idle under what? Alpha. And what's idle? Resting. Resting, not, not exerting too much, firing off of neurons. What did I say about alpha? That's the best way to learn. Yeah, best, best learning, best conversion into memory in alpha. No. Don't worry about the, the numbers. That's too many things to, to pack into our brains. Beta waves, less regular waves when we're more mentally what? So when we were watching the baseball game last night, and Pedroia dropped that ball. <gasps> you see how mad he was at himself? Oh, he's so mad. He had a lot of beta waves going on because he's like, not gonna happen again. Yeah, so, you know, you gotta love them. So, beta waves. Uh, theta, more irregular waves common in children. Children, not so common in awake adults. We see them a little bit, but not the majority. So, if I have an awake adult and I do an EEG and I see a lot of theta waves, I know there's something going on. Delta, very high amplitude, very deep waves. When do we see them? Sleep, deep sleep. Not all your sleep is deep sleep. Did you know that? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So reticular activating system sort of dampening out. During anesthesia, we see those delta waves. 
But if in, if you were, we see a lot of them in an awake adult, what's that mean? Yeah, problems. So there's some damage going on. Again, um, damage related to being able to pass this information from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Usually, we see we see you know kind of an intermediate between the two. They don't name them. So they change with age. They change with stimulus. Brain diseases, chemical state of body. So EEGs again can help to diagnose different things going on in the brain. Other exams like CAT scans and MRIs can look at more specific, more detail. But this is a quick way to say something's going on electrically. It can help to diagnose things like lesions and tumors and places in the brain where blood flow has done what? Yeah, lessened. So what happens to tissue when blood flow lessens? It starts to die off. Um, flat EEGs, yeah, so that's, that's what we define as brain dead. So we can still have other functions going on, possibly, but when we see flat EEGs, the brain is not functioning anymore. Epilepsy, what's epilepsy? It's kind of like an a electrical storm, that's the best way to to define it. So um, when we start firing off neurons in patterns that aren't normal, we start firing them off, sort of like um, wires all shorting in your house. So epilepsy may lose consciousness, and there's different forms of epilepsy. You might be having a seizure, and you're not going to be flopping around on the ground. Sometimes you have different um, different sensations. You might have visual things going on. Anybody ever have a migraine and see crazy lights? Or um, the best way to describe this is you have vision in the center and then you have this cloud around you. What's it called? It's called an aura. You can get visual ones. You can get ones where you actually start smelling things as well. Correct. So it's not always skeletal muscle, crazy skeletal muscle involvement. Say it again. Yep. There's petite mild, there's grand mild. So usually when we have a grand mild seizure, we see more skeletal muscle involvement. Um, by the way, we're talking about the skeletal system in lab. Yes? Can you swallow your tongue? No. You cannot swallow your tongue. Why can you not swallow your tongue? You can. It's attached to the hyoid bone. You're not going to swallow your tongue. One of the misconceptions of a, of a patient having a seizure is that they're going to swallow their tongue. No, they're not. Don't go near their mouth. And anybody who's dealt with somebody having a seizure understands what I just said. Exactly. Now, they might bite their tongue. Okay. But do not try to stick your hands near their mouth because they will bite your finger off. And they have no control over that. And don't just in their mouth because they'll break your teeth. Exactly. So let it pass. And one of the things that you, you should do with a seizure patient after it passes, make sure they're breathing because sometimes that reflex kicks off. So get them to breathe again. Also, turn them on their side. How come? Because they're probably going to throw up, OK? So those are things you should do. Don't try and stick anything in their mouths. That's such a misconception. Don't do that. Yeah, it, it's like they've run a marathon. They're exhausted. So they might have headaches, but they're usually very exhausted, very tired, mentally drained. 
Sometimes, sometimes not. So, they can be absence of seizures, mild seizures, auras. Usually a few minutes, may lose consciousness, be, just try to keep them contained so they don't do what? Break bones, hurt themselves. They might lose bladder control. They might lose bowel control. They might bite their tongue, but they're not going to swallow their tongue. If they do bite their tongue, just make sure you clear their ear away. Different anti-convulsive drugs help to dampen some of the impulses that get this, this electrical storm going. Um, the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, is one of the guys that helps to stabilize all of this activity as well. So again, brain waves, huh? I was just going to ask, what are the medications for seizures and migraines that antidepressants? Um, Tylenol, 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 Yeah, with the on that class of drug. Mm -hmm. Seeing that connection. So what is consciousness? Some of you are unconscious today. I'm pretty on the on the verge of unconscious myself. Uh yeah, awareness. Again, we talked about some of the stimulus that's coming into our bodies that we're unaware of. They're still there. They didn't disappear. But consciousness is the perception of whatever it is that we're experiencing. Sensation. Um, controlled movement. I can think about, I can do things without thinking about it, like moving my hands, which I do a lot of because I'm Italian and I talk with my hands. But when I start thinking about it, I see that I'm moving my hands. Conscious awareness. Um, higher mental processing is consciousness. Loss of consciousness may signal some loss of signal. May signal some loss of signal. May be an indicator of a loss of signal somewhere. Um, anybody ever faint? You know, what, and what usually? Sometimes we do that if we're really sick. Sometimes we do it if our temperature is high. Huh? And why? Why? Yeah, military guys. Why? Yeah, you think about all the blood in your blood vessels. And we'll talk about this when we talk cardiovascular system. But when you stand very still and don't contract the muscles in your legs, one of the things the muscles in your legs are very important for is getting blood back through the venous system back to your heart. If you're not contracting those muscles, you have a hard time getting your blood volume back to your heart. And unfortunately, decrease blood volume that's going where? To your head. So anything that can affect blood volume making it to your head. And that's why, what's the trick for the military guys? Exactly. Your feet and your shoes, right? Yeah. Because you're gonna you're moving you're gonna move your feet and your heels in your shoes just very slightly so that you can contract those muscles. Mm-hmm. So the vasovagal response can also cause um, uh, blood vessels to dilate very quickly. And then that's what happens. Blood flow whoo, goes down. Um, did I give you the hose example at my house? Okay. Same thing with the circulatory system. Um, so consciousness. Uh, 
what am I thinking? Alert, drowsy. I'm having a problem with alert and drowsiness and a little lethargy this morning. Stupor has also set in and sometimes coma. Um, again, um, decreased levels of consciousness. So this is clinical definitions of the decrease levels of consciousness. Um, involves different cortical areas. Uh, the, the inability or the lessened ability to retrieve some major files in cortical areas. Uh, superimposed or other neural activities. What's that mean? Superimposed on other neural activities. You're kind of cross-firing things that you normally wouldn't. So firing off neurons during activities that you normally wouldn't fire off. Holistic and totally interconnected consciousness is. So we're traveling the right roads on white matter areas in those central brain regions to get to very specific files or groups of cell bodies in gray matter regions in the cerebral cortex. Oh, sleep. There we go. Whoa! It's going to be a long day today, guys. Sleep patterns. Sleep and awake cycles. So when I sleep, I go through different levels of sleep. If you look on page 454, we're going to see the different stages of sleep. So there's five different stages that you fluctuate through during an evening's sleep. And you do this several times, depending on how old you are. We're going to see that as we get older, what happens to the time in which we fluctuate through our sleep cycles? Yeah, they get shorter. They're not as, as stretched and long. Who sleeps better, young people or old people? Those young people. How come? Think of developing a neighborhood. A young neighborhood versus an old neighborhood. <laughs> um, yeah, well, they're more, they're more active, but there's more activity. So during the evening, there's a lot more repair and regeneration and road work and all of that stuff to create that neighborhood in the young brain. In the old brain, you got some established neighborhoods. You might have to do a little sweeping, a little fixing the cracks in the sidewalk. You see what I'm saying? Doesn't take as much time. So there's different types of sleep, sleep. And this is a partial state of unconsciousness. If I get suddenly awoken, sometimes I'm a little disoriented. Does that happen to you? Like last night when I woke up, because I fell asleep in the ninth inning. I'm like, oh, crap. And I woke up, and there was Poppy with the microphone. I'm like, oh. And I said this out loud. I'm like, he's giving a speech. That must be good. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, OK, I'm back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Don't you love that wake-up call? Or thro my dog throwing up. That's always a nice wake-up. It's like, ah, catch her before she... Oh, damn. Try to get her out the door. Oh, damn. Always on the rug. Never on the floor. Always on the rug. My cat just balls. Oh, yeah. Gotta love our pets. So there's two major types of sleep. We have something called non-rapid eye movement, or N-R-E-M. And then we have rapid eye movement, which what happens during rapid eye movement? Your eyes are moving back and forth. You ever watch anybody sleep? Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a little creepy, but you can see their eyes move back and forth. Oh, jeez, that's creepy. So we pass through first two stages of non-rapid eye movement. 
and into stage three and four where we have slow wave sleep. Again, brain waves slow way down during three and four. You can see the pattern on page 500 and, uh, 454, figure 12.19. And we see at the bottom of the figure the time frame in which we go through these patterns of sleep. About 90 minutes in, after the fourth stage, we go into REM, and sleep begins abruptly. If we look at the EEG, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, GI motility, they're all going to change. Everything's going to what? Slow down, slow down. You're in what we call temporary paralysis. Do you ever feel like when you're starting to get into your sleep, just before you fall asleep, do you ever feel like, you, yeah, that did you're going to fall? Okay, so that has to do with a lot of some of the muscles that you, you contract on a regular basis to keep your posture. Those guys are starting to relax. So you feel like you're going to fall. It's a weird feeling. So again, this, this little... Um, diagram shows us some of the brain wave patterns. So non-rapid eye movement, we're going to have the highest amplitude peaks, and then we're in the beginning stages of sleep, rapid eye movement, excuse me, stage four non-rapid eye movement, we're going to have the longer, um, highest amplitude peaks. And when we're in rapid eye movement, it's very similar to what brain waves. Would look at the patterns. Those rapid eye movement and the first stage of non-rapid eye movement are very close to what? Somebody said it. Alpha waves, that awake state, just before you fall asleep. So 24 hours, we go through these different patterns. Alternating cycles of sleep and wakefulness is what we call our circadian rhythm which is described for you somewhere in the book. Where is it? Thank you. Page 354, somewhere. Yep, there it is under sleep patterns. Very good. So rapid eye movement, non-rapid eye movement, those four stages are part of your sleep cycle. And I think we mentioned a little bit about some different sleep aids that you fall asleep too, but unfortunately you don't go through your patterns of sleep. So even though you sleep, you still wake up and you feel tired. So if there's anything disrupting that, like some people have problems, snoring problems. There's a, a condition called sleep apnea. Yeah, it's a, it's a breathing issue. Um, and that can prevent you from flowing through those stages of sleep properly. Yeah. Mm hmm When I'm whack them. Yeah. And, and what happens is they wake themselves up, but they're not, it's not like a conscious awareness of awake. So they do that so frequently that they don't get a decent sleep at night. And they have what we call a CPAP machine. What does CPAP stand for? I don't know. Constant positive airway pressure, and that's going to help. And it's this god awful, ridiculous contraption that usually <laughs> nobody can sleep with, but um, it helps to make sure that the breathing continues at a regular rate um, while while they are sleeping. So sleep studies and patterns of brain waves are done on patients who have problems. Um, constantly being tired, and it can be a life-threatening um, occurrence, especially if you don't get that breathing under control. So typically the progression of an adult through one night sleep stages, and again, this is typical. What's going to happen as we age? Not going to be so typical. So we're going to go through, in a seven-hour period, we go through all four stages typically twice. And then after three and a half, four hours, and again, depending on the age, this is going to change, we're not going to cycle all the way down to stage four non-rapid eye movement. 
only do that a couple of times. What do we call that part of our sleep? Deep, deep sleep. So as we then, so, so some people, some researchers say, how many hours of sleep do we need? Some say we only need what? Four. I don't agree with them because I really enjoy my sleep. I like to sleep. So I'm going on the other side of this. I would say nine or ten would be very, very nice, wouldn't it? So yeah, some, re some people, some researchers say we only need four hours of sleep. Yeah, well, Martha, yeah, yeah, Martha. She's got all the people doing stuff for her. So. Okay, so sleep is important because this is when we do road work. When you are sleep deprived, you are grumpy as hell. Yes? yes. Why? What do you feel? What do you feel when you're sleep deprived? Well, I'm not gonna say that, but. You feel, you get, describe it. You, low energy, what else? Short, your, your emotions are definitely short. You're physically, physical, think, muscle, you, you're like your neck aches, your back, everything aches. You might get a headache. You, you start to get a little loopy. Don't ever work the, the night shift, the 3 to 11, and then... No, what it, don't work 11 to 7 and then 7 to 3.30. <laughs> By 2 o'clock, everything is funny. Everything. <laughs> I did that a few times in my, back in the day. I was like, this is the stupidest thing. It's not as bad when you work, you know, the day shift and then the night shift, but when you work the night shift and then the day shift, oh, ho, 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 ho. And that messes with your what? That messes with your circadian rhythm, and and again, it, it makes you makes you loopy. So yeah, by two o'clock, no matter what anybody said, it was funny on those nights. Yeah, exactly, because you your your reaction times aren't on you know at their best. So we need to sleep to do road work repair. Um, Unfortunately, as we get older, we're not as efficient at producing some of that wonderful melatonin that we were when we were younger, and we tend to sleep long, uh, shorter. But if you look at, you know, I look at my parents, for example, my 85-year-old dad and my 76-year-old mother. What do they do? They don't sleep at night, but during the day, yeah, they do the little cat nap thing. So their, their sleep patterns are all messed up. Stage four, that deep, deep sleep also is going to decline. And it may even disappear after the age of 60. What's one of the things that can help your sleep patterns as you age? What can you do to help you sleep better? <laughs> Drink the cherry juice. I swear by the cherry juice. I don't care what anybody says. It works. But what else besides the cherry juice? Exercise. What else? And this is something, for those of you who are, are young, listen to the old lady up here. Take my advice. You are young. You feel good. Keep it that way. Don't wait till you're older to try and fix it. If you start now, in your early 20s, or before your 20s, doing all of these things I mentioned, eat well, get plenty of rest, exercise on a regular basis, guess what? You're not going to have to fix it when you're 50 or you're 40. Yes? So do it now. I always say that to my nutrition students, that, you know, when the kids come in with their, you know, monster or whatever the hell they're drinking and you know, the Mountain Dew. Oh, who's the Mountain Dew freak in here? There's got to be a couple, right? It's like, and I had one kid in my class say, well, I'm young. I can handle it now. It's like, no. Get rid of it now. Don't make it part of your life because that will extend your life. 
What's narcolepsy? Yeah, sometimes I have that. Abrupt lapse into sleep from a wake state. That is not normal, especially when you're driving. That is not normal. <laughs> yes? So that's a problem. Um, so we want to fix the narcolepsy. Um, orexins, wake up chemicals from the hypothalamus destroyed by immune system. And that's the key to the treatment of the narcoleptic. Some of us say we're this. Now we're insomniacs. Ugh. Chronic inability to obtain amount of quality sleep needed. And most of the time it's because what's going on? Yeah, what's, what can't you slow down? Yeah. You know, you'll be in that, oh, I'm almost asleep, and then you think of 700 things that you have to do. I have to do this, I have to do that. You don't have to do it now. Yeah, and then you got to get up, and then hey, we got to start all over again. So, again, those of you who are young, those of you who are old, like me, one of the best things you can do for yourself is something called meditation. And you don't have to do it a long period of time, and you don't have to do it, you know, for hours and hours on end. And there's tons of different sources out there. But if you can train yourself to relax, breathing, blocking out all of the other crap that you have in your mind, you do yourself a big, huge favor if you fall into that insomniac category. So go, and, go online, get yourself one of those little oh, meditation things. Hypnosis, anybody ever hear of hypnosis? Okay. But one of the things that those practices do is help you to do what? Relax. Relax. I like the breathing. Counting. The breathing. Inhale. Or counting down to relax. All of these different techniques will be your best friend. And you can, and you can do this for 20 minutes. And you can feel like you've slept and you're rejuvenated and you're a brand new person. So try it. You'll love it. Best thing you can do for yourself. So insomniac. Sleep apnea, temporary, that's the breathing thing. That can cause hypoxia when it gets too out of control. And that can cause problems with getting your brain oxygenated properly. So we want to make sure we take care of sleep apnea. Language. So where the heck do we get the language from? Well, who's going to help us with it anyway? Mm -hmm. So the files that we're going to keep are in Broca's and Wernicke's area. These are places where we're going to get to the files of language. Um, did anybody ever get, and I wish I had that email. Do I have it in there? No. I used to have it in my old PowerPoint. I should go and find one. Did you ever get that email with, um, the words are all jumbled. The word itself. Your first letter and your last letter is where it should be in the word. And then all the letters in between are jumbled, and you can read it just fine. Well, some of us can. Not, not everybody can. Correct. Patterns. So what we have to file is patterns. And as we get better at it, like when you teach a child how to read, you see this. When they first learn how to read, they sound out every letter in the word. But once you've done that more and more and more, you really are just looking at the first and the last letter. And you can still read the word, the patterns. So these patterns, these analyses, these files are kept in Broca's and Wernicke's. They analyze incoming sounds. So another thing that helps us with words is our sense of hearing. So some of these things go hand in hand. We'll see that our sense of smell and tracks of our sense of smell pass very closely by some of the files we keep for different memories. So during Christmas, for example, you're in the kitchen 
and you're making the cookies that you make every year at Christmas, what might you start doing? Re remembering something that you used to do when you were little. Because why? That particular smell is running very close to that particular memory, and it helps to bring it to consciousness. Um, produces outgoing sounds and grammatical structures. So not only lang language is not only hearing, understanding, being able to recognize, but it's also what? I have to speak. I have to verbalize. So language involves both. Now memory. Remember, this is the road well traveled. Short-term memory, long-term memory. Short-term memory is kind of a temporary holding place. Seven or eight pieces of information can stay in that short-term memory. How many numbers are there in a phone number? How come? Well, yeah, that's about it. Don't you hate it now when you call information? And they give you the area code. It's like I go, la, 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 I don't want to hear the year. I know the Erie code. It's 207. I live in Maine. There's only one. Right? That messes me up. Seven numbers. I have to say the seven numbers. Most of the time now, because I'm old, I have to write them down. Otherwise, the minute I hang up the phone, I forget, and I have to call back. Yes? And then the stupid lady, huh? Yeah, see now, yeah. But if the lady then comes back and repeats herself, oh crap, I gotta listen to it again, right? <laughs> right? You're all experienced this. I'm not the only one, right? Then they say something afterwards. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't be saying anything. The minute that number's done, hang up on that woman. Because if she says one more thing, forget it. You're gonna have to call back again, right? That's short-term memory. Only a couple of bits of information. So me saying this to you, short-term memory, what are you going to do? Uh, don't file it. It's filed. You're going to go get the file out. And you're going to go get the file out. You're going to go get the file out. Yes? Repetition, repetition. So you can put it into what? Long-term Long memory. You have more file cabinets than you are ever, ever, ever going to use in your entire lifetime. Way, way more file cabinets than you need. We only use a very small portion of our brain. So what are some of the things that can help transfer short-term to long-term memory? To all of these things. When, and this is why when, when I talk to you about studying, I say, are you a visual learner? Are you an auditory learner? What the hell does that mean? Well, this is what it means. What stimulus causes you to remember something more? We all have different patterns and different combinations. Some of us can read a book and remember what we read. Is that me? Nope. Reading a book puts me to sleep. It's a good Good sleeping pill. There's several pictures that my parents took of me while I was in college with the book like this and me drooling on myself because I fall asleep. <laughs> Touch, do, feel. That's some people's way. Hearing, that's my way. So when I went to a lecture, if I had a good lecturer that explained things well, and I heard it, I remembered it. Smell can also, like those cookies at Christmas time, help with memories. Trick, when you study, incorporate some of these other senses. How can you incorporate smell to your study? Could, we could apply some of these scratch and sniffs to the book. Wouldn't that be nice? Ooh, nervous system, lemon. But what, I know, I'm tired. <laughs> it was a long night. So how could we incorporate our sense of smell to our study time? Do you know the trick? Okay, here we go. 
I'm studying. You're doing it right now. What are you chewing? Gum. What kind of gum? Mint gum. Mint. Smell. Well, I'm studying this stuff. Chew the gum. Or suck on a, you know, whatever you like to, to have, you know, lifesavers or wintergreen or whatever you like to suck on for hard candy. I, I like candles, but you can't bring a candle to class and light it. So, so think of something you can stick in your mouth. Okay, or I, another thing I really like is peppermint. And I, I actually, yeah, I have peppermint essential oil. It sits on my desk. And every once in a while when I feel like I'm going to fall asleep, I'll get a little drop and I'll put it under my nostrils. Anything that causes you to breathe in, because what's that going to help you with? If I breathe properly, I'm going to get more oxygen. I get more oxygen. My brain gets more oxygen. I can make more energy. I can do my road work better. Yes? So that familiar gum in your mouth. So you're studying with that gum in your mouth. What should you do on test day? Bring the gum. Because that's going to help you do what? It's going to help you retrieve those files, just like the cookies did helped you retrieve those memories of childhood. <laughs> That's another story. I don't think the president would like it too much if you bring a big old bottle of wine to class. I wouldn't mind as long as you shared, but, but yeah. You don't want to deaden your senses. You want to, yeah. So again, combinations of this, because some of you will come to my office and say, oh, Try different things. Try different things to help you remember. Some of us like little mnemonics. Some of us, uh, my daughter, and this is crazy, but that girl can remember the lyrics to every single song she's ever heard. She remembers them all. I, don't, I, I can't even understand them, and she can sing them. So what she started doing, she's in nursing school, third year. Guess what she does? She sings, you know, whatever works. That's what I say. So short-term to long-term memory, that's the key. Now, what's some of the factors? Look at these factors. Emotional state. If you're alert, motivated, surprised, and aroused. Rehearsal, repetition, 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 repetition. Then associate. And that's why when I lecture you, I tell you all these ridiculous stories. And I, and I talk about all kinds of little things like the file cabinets and the road work. But hopefully that will help you do what? It's going to help you associate this crazy information with something you already know. And that helps us to learn. That helps us to file from short-term to long-term memory. And then automatic memory, subconscious, information stored in long-term memory. Usually you remember something traumatic, yes? Even though it happens short-term, short it sticks in your head. You know, that, that scary dream before you woke up, or that scary event. You might not remember every single detail, but that sticks in your mind. And those tend to go quickly from short-term to long-term memory. We don't want to scare the bejesus out of you when we make you learn this stuff, but that actually does happen as well. So we want to declare fact or declarative fact memory. Explicit information related to conscious thoughts and language ability stored in long-term memory. You have a lot of stuff in long-term memory that you can't access. Do you know that? Remember that crap you learned when you were in fifth grade? Yeah, you do. It's there. It's filed. All that math stuff I learned, and I had the algebra. And the graph and the linear equation, you guys are probably doing that stuff now. I haven't done that since, I can't remember when. Do I know it? Yep. Can I get the files? Nope.
to, to elicit those memories again. So you sometimes suppress memories. It's a protection mechanism for you as well. That's what they say about women giving childbirth. You forget the pain. Yeah, no, I don't forget. Well, you do, though. You, you remember it was pain, but it's different. You're remembering it was Yeah, and then, then oh, baby, let's have another one. Ah! Yeah. You feel, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Like, well, because you're exposed to it all the time, that's why. And you can understand, you know, their pain because you've been through their, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we have non declare uh, that word, memory. Less conscious or unconscious. Experience and repetition requires this, uh, or places it in your files. Um, best remembered by doing, hard to unlearn. Yeah, or some quirky little pattern you have. Um, a lot of sports, sports people go through this, right? They'll have some little quirky thing they do. Let's, well, since baseball is on the forefront. Um, nowadays, they have all these different computers that analyze all kinds of movements in athletes. And they try to eliminate some of the, the detrimental movements they might have. But when you've done this for so many years that way, it's very, very difficult to stop doing it that way. You do it unconsciously. And it's very hard to unlearn it. So um, those different patterns that you learn. That's why it's best to, you know, hopefully learn it the right way the first time because it's really hard to unlearn some of these movements. Yeah, or you, you know, one of my, oh, anybody a huncher? I'll be, I'll be at my computer some days and I'm like, <laughs> <I'm> like oh, <laughs> sit up straight. But you look, you know, you, you do that. I hope this microphone is on. Okay, good. Um, you know, that's, that's little patterns you get into. That's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to give up smoking. Because what, what is it besides the smoke that draws you to the habit? It's all the physical stuff. It's the associations you have with different things. One of the hardest things, and yes, I did smoke. So ex-smokers are the most obnoxious people in the world. Because we know you can quit, so quit. Because we can, if we did it, you can do it. But that was one of the hardest things for me to do was get in my car. Because one of the things I did every morning was do what? I got in the car, I lit a cigarette. So just the association with the, with the habit, the pattern, and the place. It was, yeah, or, you know, and now, now they don't let you do it, but back in my day, when you were at a, at a pub or a bar, you know, you'd just automatic. So different activities that you associate with that habit. Very difficult to unlearn. So replace it with something else. So you know what I had in my car when I quit smoking? The straw, the coffee stirrer straws. <laughs> I'd get in the car, I'd pull one out, suck on the straw, just the suck on the straw. It was okay. It helped. They have something called an electronic cigarette. Anybody see them? Yep, yeah, buy one. They're, they're much better for you than smoking a cigarette. And it's water vapor. So you're still getting the nicotine, which isn't the greatest thing, but if... It's, it's a good way to begin the process of stopping because you still get to th go through all the motions and you're not getting the harmful smoke and all of those additives. So start that way. 
Did you, were you going to say something? Somebody started to say something and I interrupted them. No? I'm... Okay, so emotions can also play a role in memory formation. Um, stress can also block memory formation. So stop stressing out. Relax. Get yourself a little hypnosis tape. Breathe. Get into alpha. And then you'll all be brain surgeons. Right? Hippocampus and surrounding temporal lobes function in consolidation and access to memory. So again, these central regions are sort of the roadways to go to the file cabinets, getting those information, uh, or accessing those files and information. ACH, what's that? That's acetylcholine from the basal forebrain is necessary for memory formation and retrieval. We met that particular neurotransmitter when we covered chapter 11. Is that ringing a bell? <coughs> so this is kind of the pattern of grabbing files and storing them. The association cortex is involved. Sensory input is involved. And it might take several different types of sensory input to get from long-term to short-term memory. What's procedural memory? Hmm? Yeah, patterns of things. And again, basal nuclei is involved, sensory input, motor output, motor memory, the cerebellum is going to be involved in that, that coordination guy. And I, when I talk about motor memory, I'm thinking about repetitive motion kind of things, like typing or playing an instrument, or walking, <laughs> which is difficult for some of us on some days. Emotional memory, a region called the amygdala, is going to help with that as well. So during learning, what do we have to do? Fire off those neurons make new proteins, cells are doing something different. And this is the chemical basis for warp memory. <coughs> I'm not going to get too crazy about that, but understand that the cells are doing something different, different than what they were doing before I was going to store that memory. It involves protein synthesis. What's that? Chapter 3. Huh? Correct. Putting together of amino acids to make proteins. And who helped me with that? Ribosomes and transfer RNA and messenger RNA. So we're going to make new messenger RNA because we're making new what? Who? We're making memories, but chemical. Think chemical. We're making new proteins. So dendritic spines might change shape because what, what's happening? They are they're the receiving end of the neuron, right? And then we might see more extracellular proteins being deposited at the synapse. So more of those receptors on the surface of cells will appear and that's what's involved in creating long-term memory. So when you learn something, is the structure of your brain ever going to be the same? No. You're changing structure. When you learn, you change proteins on the surface of cells. That's your file cabinet. So that's what's going on. You might also increase the number of synapses increases the, the connections from one neuron to the next. Remember when we looked at the axon terminals and the synapses axon to dendrite, you didn't necessarily just have one axon and one dendrite, right? You had a whole bunch. You can make more. 
and fire off more things. So as I learn an action and I commit it to memory, I might actually be making more connections to more groups of neurons. When I learn something muscle-wise, anybody go to the gym and uh, lift weights? <laughs> so I did this. What are you doing? You build muscle, you make more fibers within the cells, but you also make more connections with the nervous system and different muscle groups. Because as you increase the weight on that machine, what do you have to increase? The number of what? The number of muscle fibers you're using to push that weight. Who fires off the muscular system? The nervous system, yes? You getting the connection? OK. Yeah, is the attendance sheet going around? Who needs to sign it? Oi, don't be keeping it to yourself. Pass it around. So long-term potential, LTP, long-term memory, increases the strength at the synapse, sort of reinforces the chemical changes that took place. Neurotransmitters like glutamate bind to receptors, opening calcium channels in the postsynaptic terminals. What the hell does that mean? What was calcium doing for me at the postsynaptic, the end of the axon, into the beginning of the new neuron? Think of the end of the axons, axon terminal. When calcium flows in, what's it going to cause to happen? Who? What reaction? Woo! It's before the action potential. We're not there yet. We're at the end. We're at the end. When the calcium flows in at the end of the axon, that's What's going to happen? What happens at the end of the axon? No, that's the beginning. Neuro! Say it loud! Neurotransmitter gets what? Yeah! And what's going to happen to the postsynaptic neuron? all that other stuff you were saying. <laughs> right? So when calcium flows in at the end of the axon, it's going to cause the release of neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is going to come in contact with the dendrites, receptors on the dendrites. Sodium is going to rush in. Yeah, and cause what? No mass. Change of charge within the cell. It's going to flow into the axon hillock. You know the rest of the story. Yes? Or hopefully you know the rest of the story. So, yeah, you've got to remember it. Now you have to go repetition, repetition, repetition. And chew some gum. <laughs> Calcium influx activates enzymes that help to modify different proteins. So. That's what happens outside the cell, but inside the cell we're making modifications as well. Um, second messenger systems, and we saw a little bit about that in the um, chapter 11 as well, is going to help develop some different proteins. Um, protein kinases are going to get activated. So we are changing what's going on within the cell when we form a memory. And we're changing what's on the surface of the cell when we form a memory. You with me? Oh my gosh, we gotta get some kick it into gear. All right, protection of the brain. Very important. Skull. That's important. How come? 
Yeah, it protects the brain. So the skull is one of the strongest protections that you have with respect to the skeletal system. The skull contains your brain. Meninges are also part of that protection. What's a meninge? Yeah, membranes. There's three layers of the meninges that we're going to talk about in a minute. Then we have fluid. So when I go like this, I don't get brain damage. How come? Because the meninges are going to act like little pillows, and the fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, is going to act like a cushion as well. The other important thing, and we've mentioned this several times in our discussion here, is the blood-brain barrier. What's that? It stops certain substances from blood plasma getting into your cerebrospinal fluid. So it's kind of those ependymal cells doing their very selective removal of materials from your plasma. I think I mentioned this in class. If I didn't, I'm repeating myself. But one of the most difficult things for a drug company to do is to develop a drug that can pass the blood-brain barrier. So if they're looking for something that's going to have an effect within the central nervous system, they have to pass the blood-brain barrier. So sometimes you can have an amazing drug that does amazing things in, in a rat or in a mouse or in a rabbit, but when you put it in a human, the ependymal cells say, mm, nope, not coming into the spinal fluid, sorry. And you've got to start back from square one. The, uh, why there's so many diseases? I think it's it's why it's so hard to control or. Yep. Yep, because it's so hard to get drugs that will actually have an effect on diseases like that. So the meninges are, are the coverings. They protect the central nervous system, which is what? Brain and spinal cord. So we see the meninges not only covering the brain, but running all the way down the spinal cord as well. Protect blood vessels. Help to keep them in place and protect them. Cerebrospinal fluid. And then we have the skull. Three layers of the meninges. The dura mater, which means what? Tough mother. And that's what it means. Where is that? The tough mother. That's on the outside. Okay, then we have the other two guys, one in the middle, the arachnoid mater. What's arachnoid? Spider. Spiders make what? Webs. Guess what the arachnoid looks like? Spider webs. A lot of reticular fibers. And then we have the pia mater. What's the pia mater? The gentle mother. And where's the gentle mother sit? Directly on the tissue. So the gentle layer, the delicate layer, sits directly on the brain matter. When you dissect your brains this semester, and that's what you're going to do in a couple of weeks, after we're done with all this bone nonsense, you will see those coverings. And when you take the tough covering off, you're going to look at your little um, sheep brain, and it's going to look shiny. And guess what that is? That's the pia mater. That's sit. It's, it's like vacuum sealed to the brain material itself. The arachnoid mater is going to dissolve. And it dissolves because of the chemicals that your uh, sample sits in. So basically, you have a dura mater. The space between it is a sinus or space. We call them different things. They're defined in here. And what we're going to find flowing through those spaces is cerebrospinal fluid, blood vessels, and uh, different nerve groups. When I get an inflammation of the meninges, what's that called? Meningitis. Why is that bad? pressure on something's going to do what? Eventually damage it or destroy it. 
and your file cabinets are all there, so that's not a good thing, yes? So inflammation of the meninges can be very dangerous. This diagram you will probably see again at some point in your life. Which lab practical might that be? Your third and final. <gasps> wow, that's scary. So you will see this diagram again. We see the scalp, the bone. Underneath is the periosteum. What's that? Periosteum. Peri. Osteum. Huh? Yeah, it's a bone. Peri. Goes around. So periosteum, then we have the skull, the bone itself, that little bone sandwich, compact bone, spongy bone in the middle. Yep. What's underneath that? So we have a layer, the dura mater. There's two layers of the dura mater. What's the dura mater called again? Tough mother. So we have the periosteal layer of the dura mater, which is near the what? The bone. Yes, around the bone. And then we have the meningeal layer, which is near the other meningi friends. Arachnoid mater. See it? Kind of looks like spider webs in there. And then the pia mater that sits directly on the brain tissue itself. So, dura mater is the strongest meningi or meninx, plural. Two layers, fibrous, connective, and separates to form what we call the dural venous sinus. Important for what? Supplying your brain with who? Blood. We see the dura mater kind of infolding in some of those deep infolds. Falx cerebelli in the longitudinal fissure. Falx cerebri, cerebri in the what? That fold between the who and the where? Cere cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. Very good. And then we have the tentorium cerebelli, the horizontal dural fold over the cerebrum in transverse fissure. So we see some of these guys where we find them and the, how important those blood vessels are. That's kind of cool. That's an actual skull. My nephew just did this at the University of Maryland. He's in medical school there. And he always texts me and tells me about his cadaver dissection. So they're doing head and neck now. It's so cool. We don't have a human brain, sorry. Costs too much money. But it's kind of neat if you go look at your pal. Everybody's got one, right? Not a friend, but your practice anatomy lab. And you can see some of the uh, human cadaver dissections. There's some good pictures in your atlas, too. Arachnoid mater, that's the middle layer. The space is called the what? Subdural, underneath the dura mater space. Then we also have a space underneath the arachnoid called the? Subarachnoid space. We're going to see blood vessels passing through here, cerebrospinal fluid. And then we have little protrusions of the arachnoid called the arachnoid villi. What happens in the arachnoid villi? Anybody know? Ooh. What happens? Read it off the. Yeah, this is where the reabsorption of what? Cerebrospinal fluid. So we're constantly making cerebrospinal fluid in the choroid plexuses. And what do we find in the choroid plexuses? Plexuses. Ependymal cells and lots of blood vessels, right? And in the arachnoid villi, we're doing what? Reabsorbing old stuff. What happens if I get plugged up? And I keep making it, and I don't reabsorb it. 
It, that's a problem. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, we see a little, oh, did I go in the wrong direction? Um, we see, I think there's a picture, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, hydroce hydrocephalic, um, hydrocephalus and newborn, figure 12.25 on page 462. It's a problem with building up that fluid. And that can be a big issue because it can cause so much pressure on the brain that it can start to damage the brain tissue. Um, Piamata, very delicate, vascularized connective tissue. That's the one that's sitting directly on the brain. What's the spinal fluid made of? Mostly water formed from blood plasma. We call it an ultrafiltrate of plasma. Um, sometimes you can look at the composition of spinal fluid and tell whether a person is having problems with the central nervous system due to infection. Um, if there's a bacterial issue, if I take cerebrospinal fluid out and I find a very high protein content, or if I find a very high glucose content, I can tell different things about what's going on with my patient, uh, whether it be a viral event or a bacterial event. So we can have viral meningitis, we can have bacterial meningitis. So that's what a spinal tap does. It analyzes the chemical components of the spinal fluid to see who's, who's messing with the spinal fluid. And again, constant volume is important. If we have too much volume, too much pressure, that can cause damage. Um, buoyancy in the brain reduces weight by 97% because don't you feel lighter when you're floating? Yeah, so does the brain. Protects the central nervous system from any blows or trauma and also provides those cells with nutrients. This diagram shows the flow of cerebrospinal fluid through the central nervous system. You can see this on page 461 in your textbook. So choroid plexuses, what are those? Yeah, and what do they do? It's produce cerebrospinal fluid. It also help it to do what? Keep it in motion, help it circulate. Uh, normal volume of, volume of cerebrospinal fluid is about 150 milliliters on average, and that whole entire volume replaces every eight hours. So you make a whole new 150 mils, and you get rid of 150 mils. Where does the get rid of 150 mils go? Nope. Back into what? back into the circulatory system. If there's waste products in it, it might end up, some of it might end up in urine, some of it might end up in your <sighs> breathing out, some of it might get sweated out. Yes? So we see a picture of what's going on in the choroid plexuses. You see the little ependymal cells that surround it, and those are like little hairy creatures, and then your circulatory system. So that is a choroid plexus. Uh, hydrocephalus is when we have an obstruction of the flow, either block of reabsorption typically is what we see. So we get a buildup of pressure, and that can cause trauma to the brain. We see that picture in the textbook. Um, Blood-brain barrier, again, your filtering system that we see in those ependymal cells providing for us. Helps to maintain a very stable environment in the brain and separates the neurons from anything that might be bad in blood. Unfortunately, some of the bad stuff comes in too, but typically the blood-brain barrier can, can filter out a lot of the harmful substances. Uh, who's going to help me with that? Who's that guy? 
the astrocytes. So some of the neural glia can also help um, with getting substances from blood to cells or taking waste products from neuron um, metabolism into the circulatory system. So it's a very selective barrier, allows nutrients to move. What's facilitated diffusion? So some way of taking something out of the blood, some sort of package, bringing it into the ependymal cells and then taking it from the ependymal cells and throwing it into cerebrospinal fluid. So it's a very selective way of getting things from blood into cerebrospinal fluid. Um, metabolic waste, proteins, toxins, most drugs, small non-essential amino acids, and potassium can't make it in. Uh, Fat-soluble substances to pass, including alcohol, nicotine, and anesthetics. So those guys can make it in. So nicotine has a direct effect on who? Your brain. Um, vomiting centers, hypothalamus, necessary to monitor chemical compositions of blood, are places that pay close attention to what's in blood. So we don't see as much going on there with respect to the blood-brain barrier, because these are direct monitors of what's going on in the circulatory system. These are the guys that are going to tell me your oxygen levels are low. I need to send a message to your circulatory system and respiratory system. So if I filter out plasma for these guys, they're not going to be able to do their jobs properly. So they have a more direct connect to the circulatory system. Does that make sense? Um, traumatic brain injury, concussions, when I do that way too much or way too hard. Because even though I have meninges and cerebrospinal fluid, I can still bang my head hard enough to cause trauma. That's a problem, especially if it happens all the time. We will pick up with homeostat. Oh, wait a minute, where are we now? Yeah, we got, we got, we still have to do a lot on the spinal cord. Okay, so we will pick up with um, homeostatic imbalances of the brain. Boy, this chapter's taken a long time. But listen. I know it's taken a long time to get through this chapter. There's a lot of information here. So you should be studying. Yeah? Don't forget. Don't forget.